Welcome everyone, this is Denny and Carl with Get Wisdom and today we're going to continue with our channeling series and today Carl is going to channel Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis who was the first lady in the early 60s and she was the wife of JFK and in 63 he was assassinated as most people know and and most people will know, people who followed us know that we've already done a channeling with uh, JFK and we may do a follow up at some point because there's a wealth of information there. Uh, we got some very interesting answers from him in that channeling series. But today we're going to do Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. And um, Carl has already done a spirit rescue for her. And he's, you know, obviously very familiar with this, with this person. And so we're going to discuss that a little bit before we get started. So thanks, Carl. Thanks for joining us. You know, thank you, Danny. Thanks for watching. All of you who take an interest in this. This isn't another tabloid exercise, <laughs> and I was just chatting with Denny before we got started at how strongly Jackie Kennedy was loved by the American people, and she grew on us all, and her role as First Lady, and with the tragedy ever more so, and, and then things kind of became tawdry, and it's the power of the media to twist things and appeal to the the bizarre or the the the, the tawdry or the you know that discomforts and suffering of other people and make a spectacle of it and it's most unfortunate because it's not deserved it never is and it goes on and on and on and and so one has to feel sympathy for anybody who's in the spotlight and then becomes kind of like a commodity you know, that can be right. pulled out again and again and again and used as a touchstone and, and an example or an icon or something to poke fun at or just raise bizarre questions about for no good reason other than it's press and yeah. gets eyeballs to the screen. And so we're, we're interested more in, the humanity here and what people who've been here in life and had an important role in things can tell us now they're back in the light and have that higher perspective about life and its meaning. And 
they can teach us many things, many lessons, and give us a, a taste of that perspective. People talk a lot about enlightenment and wanting to be enlightened, and you know we know there's this shift in consciousness that's supposed to do that, and but most people don't really embrace it so much personally. You know, they're more like an outsider looking in. You know, they're thinking about it, pondering it, but not doing too much about that. You know, so it, it, it's ironic, but you have to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. So I I have very strong feelings about uh, Jackie Kennedy and her family. Having lived through that era myself, I'm old enough to remember it quite well. Um. I had my 16th birthday when JFK announced the presence of nuclear missiles in Cuba, 90 miles off the coast of the U.S., and uh, um, followed that whole era with the the tragic events that unfolded to uh, cause his death and, and what it did to the Kennedy family. And that continued down through the years. So... It's very much intertwined with the state of affairs in the world, not only the United States of America. Right. But these are world level figures and for many deep reasons. So I'm, I'm really excited and I feel very honored and blessed to be in this position to connect with with her again. I did a spirit rescue for her along the way in my um, practice in helping heal people from all sorts of dilemmas. And once I learned that this is a common dilemma of folks, that they don't make it back to the light necessarily. Yeah. And it's particularly so when there is a difficult circumstance going on for them, especially in that end stage of life. And they're really not prepared to raise their vibration dramatically in order to get back into that higher realm once again, because we're down in a very low vibration environment here and people will pass from the body and not see the light callers who always come to greet them and help escort them back. And then they can get stuck. And this happened to her. And it was many, many, many years later because it was only a few years ago I did this. So yeah. she had been out there a good long while. She, I forget the exact year she passed, but it was years yeah. in between. Yes. And she was suffering and floundering in the darkness, tumbling in the dark. This is what it's like because you lose your normal senses. So um, I did some karmic repair for her. That's how I help people make their full transition bring in healing for them that's keeping them still in a low ebb. And that raising up is what enables them to cooperate with the light callers and then make their way. Okay. So I reached out to her, you know, through, through love. I mean, it was one of the most loving outreaches I've done because of my care for her. And um, I work on all sorts of folks. I, I do a lot of serial killers and, and things because they're humans as well. And I have the big picture in mind that they're going to be back one day. And if we if we don't help them through some healing, there'll be more victims likely. This is how it, it works. It's a karmic setup to keep doing what you're doing, suffering what you're suffering or harming others the way you've harmed them in a, the most recent life and so on. So I, I did do some karmic repair for her. And like everyone else, she was human, had human issues that she suffered from and had a past history and other lifetimes uh, that I'm sure had a bearing on that go round as Jackie Kennedy as we knew her. And uh, uh, this is true for all of us. So up in the light, she'll be looking at that broad sort of tapestry and and can weigh in about various things. So we're hoping that the questions that you've picked, Denny, will strike a chord in the kind of information that comes forth and will be helpful yeah. in a broader understanding of, of things. And uh, so that that's really, I don't want to, I'd like to get to it, you know, and rather okay. than... Right. sort of uh, speculate or 
Yeah, and the, and the only thing that I wanted to say, you know, I, I always I always learn so much when I do the research for the questions and stuff. And the thing that really impressed me initially as I as I learned more about her was the episode where she uh, redid the White House and what mm-hmm. a transition that was and how that changed uh, a lot of things. It's probably still pers- persisting to this day because she did so many, uh, like, I guess would be considered tasteful things, like upgrading um, the White House. You know, she w- she studied all the earlier presidents and she looked at uh, archival photographs and drawings and everything about what, you know, what was, what was the white house la- like back in the day. And she recruited people to help her find uh, certain antiques and, um, and she just redid the white house. And then she, then she did, um, I think she had a television tour of it. And then all of a sudden she was uh, the sweetheart of the, of, you know, the darling of the U S and, um, Whereas before she was kind of kept in the background and they didn't quite know what to do with her. You know, she was the young, beautiful wife of a Catholic president uh, who, who knew how to speak foreign languages and was kind of metropolitan and well-educated, uh, knew a lot about books. She, she used to translate books from French to English for JFK uh, before they got married. And I think after they got married, she did a little bit of that too. And, uh, so she was kind of an oddball in that Washington scene. And uh, this transition of the White House changed everything. And uh, and then, you know, the, the fashion, you know, what she wore, the shoes, the hats, all that stuff became front and center for women in the United States. And she, and she was also um, striking insofar as that she didn't have a lot of the um, – um, the, um, the women's lib type thing that was just starting to come into power in those years. She, she kind of held to more traditional female role, role models. And, and she would defend those, um, in some instances pretty aggressively. And so she, so that was my, that was the thing that struck me as very, being very interesting mm-hmm. about her and, uh, how she influenced, uh, Washington and the media and even foreign relations, because, you know, with her language abilities, they would go ahead and put her on the podium because she could speak Spanish and she spoke Spanish to uh, the Cuban rebel thing. You know, when that when you were talking about the Bay of Pigs and all that stuff, you know, she was part of that. And and when they went to France, she, she and met De Gaulle. She spoke French with him. And so she was she became kind of a player. Whereas first ladies in the in the past had been kind of, you know, they had the, this little niche and that's where they had to stay, and she yeah. she didn't do that. And um, even with the White House um, upgrade that she that she did, she kind of did that on her own. She didn't have a lot of support initially to do that, and they and I don't think anybody really foresaw the mileage that they got out of that in terms of promoting uh, JFK's pr- presidency. So that was. Um, yeah. something that's really struck me about her that I didn't really fully appreciate before. Well, her role as a wife and mother, you know, very much within that mold of the, the uh, you know, traditional view of family and the role of the female and so on. But this is not an inferior role. <laughs> this, is, this is central to life itself and, and the culture. As well, it's the crucible for life. The upbringing of children is everything in how things proceed, because it all depends on the quality of life people have in their formative years. And that comes largely through the mother in modern society. Dad's off working. It's just the way it has to be. And having known men in my life who were the stay home mom of the family where the wife had the profession. It's no different. They're full-time caregivers for the young. It's all consuming. It's not something you can just do with one hand. You know, you, you, you've got to have the time available to devote. Right. And, you know, when kids are older, then you can have nannies and, you know, sitters and daycare of one sort or another. But it, there's a crucial role there. And her position in her her uh, iconic persona was very much central to 
her role as a female, as a woman, first lady, and supporting her husband and his administration, but as, you know, a partner. And that was the the sense of it. It was a partnership. She wasn't like a lesser being. She was... She was very much appreciated by her husband and and promoted, and as you say, and her role as a, a mother in acting with such courage under the most tragic circumstances and taking care of her kids through all the aftermath of the great losses and, and all of the stress yeah. and seeing her whole life completely turned upside down. And that's no small thing. No. And she pulled it off and she... She was a devoted mom, and that is divinity in action from where I sit. Exactly. Yeah, so she was, you know, well-rounded person. That's really the way to think of her, I think. You know, know, she was female, but she was a well-rounded person. She did what she was called on to do. She stepped up, and she applied herself and she was equal to the task yeah she like, made and, her, I, and i suspect she, in a more normal world if we had you know like we talked about this in one of our webinars or something like you know humans really don't don't know what it's like to live in a society that's built around um you know divinely guided humans we don't know what that looks like we don't you know most of the trappings that we have in our world are actually alien trappings things that were taught to us by the overlords you know, I suspect a huge part of government is is that and only that. Um, and so what I'm getting at here is that, you know, the partnership that we're talking about between male and females is something that has never really been um, something we've observed in uh, with with a with a large measure of divinely guided action, thought, spiritual incl- inclinations. So. You know, it's going to be a discovery process for us if, you know, you know, assuming that the human experiment's even successful, that's something we're going to grow into. And it's not going to be based on past experiences or past role models. It's going to be something, I mean, there's some trappings of it, of course, because we're human. But, I mean, I think it's it's very healthy to have a, a, an extremely open mind about that because the female has been diminished in so many ways in in modern human societies that in, in its in its role, in its divinely guided role, it's going to be something quite different from anything we've ever, ever seen. That's my speculation. Yeah, well, I think it's a good perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Well, she she'll have an opportunity to address that idea because you know, um, it's kind of intimated in some of the questions here. So maybe we can go ahead and get started. All right. Very good. <clears throat> Um, I'll be doing my thing. I go into a particular state of consciousness to make a connection to the other side of the veil. And I do it through the creator of all that is, not just on my own, uh, with my own psychic ability. I specifically go through the Almighty, and I do that for safety and accuracy both. And I say this as a kind of litany because not everyone knows not everyone has gotten the word channeling is fraught with peril in terms of connecting with something that is not desirable but might be an imposter that will attempt to fool you and there's lots of beings out there who are quite skilled at this they've been doing it all through human history And this is why some of the early prophecies, even things in the scriptures are not accurate in in being divine information and divine messages, the word of God, if you will. Their corruption, contamination in the thinking that came through a prophet who dropped their guard, wasn't as cautious and got false information. So um, I just want to mention that. I am doing my best here to keep the work pristine and very much have safety in mind as I go about doing it. And, you know, always want to encourage others who engage in any sort of intuitive exploration to ask the highest level of divinity to safeguard what you're doing, to help protect it 
from any unwanted intrusion or manipulation. And that can be quite important. There's lots of disinformation out there and yeah. lots of it sounds good because they know that's the way to influence us. They use candy. They use treats. They give you lots of talk about love and, and some all of it is things. truth. And some of it is truth. It's, yeah. you know, 90% more and more will be very truthful. And in fact, divine teachings because they learn that from us and then they feed it back to us. Right. And these beings are all atheists. They are working against love and light, but they use the trappings to clothe themselves. And so this is the classic wolf in sheep's clothing scenario that right. we're all too often engaged with. So, okay. all right. So I will do my thing and, uh, connect to Jackie Kennedy, and then she will announce she's here. All right? Okay. All right. Thank you. This is Jackie Kennedy speaking. Thank you for joining us. It was understood that you received a spirit rescue from our channel, and now that you've been able to reun reunite not only with your husband, JFK, but also your son, John, and your babies that died very soon after birth, can you tell us what it's like to be re reunited in the light with your loved ones. This is a much bigger and grander spectacle than you can imagine as a human being. First of all, the light beings are bigger and vaster in scope, the energy they represent, the capabilities they have to engage with one another. It is a multi-layer experience to do so and can be enjoyed as a group process as opposed to a one-on-one -on -one exchange when people in the physical come together. So to reunite with a group, with loving beings who have truly been compatriots in the grandest of undertakings, to come into physical life, share the vicissitudes and the many sources of negativity, impairing things, holding each person down, each in their own way, creating divisions, creating burdens, creating distortion, many disappointments, and many failures, and the consequences of shortcomings and disastrous choices whether present through faulty thinking from old karmic corruption or through a direct manipulation. This is all swept away when being in the light. There is no filter. There are no limitations. It is a 100% sharing of knowledge, information, and awareness on multiple levels simultaneously. So this is the ultimate of group hugs, so to speak, where multiple beings can come together energetically and intertwine with one another in a grand sharing of love. And it is really impossible to describe to you because there is nothing like this in your experience. But we can tell you this is worth looking at and anticipating and remembering as the ultimate of rewards, being your return to the light, the higher possibilities. You are on vacation, in a sense, from reality when you are a physical human. And this is useful because it strips everything down to bare essentials. In a sense, it is a kind of childhood of a lifelong nature, being quite constrained and quite limited in power and reach, but then having to make the most of it. Very much like a child left on their own in a big house who can't reach 
what is on the countertops, who can't climb on all the furniture or explore the contents of drawers and cabinets outside their reach, but must make their way nonetheless to amuse themselves and to learn things and hopefully grow in the process and develop new skills. All of life is like this for the physical human. And it is in order to have a kind of a circling back to look again at first principles and view things in their raw elemental form to better appreciate all of the components. Because as creative beings, what is most valuable to know is the full potential of each component of energy that might be brought to life. If you don't know what life means, what it is capable of doing, and what it needs to be like in order to work well, to function smoothly, and contribute something new in growth of possibilities, you will not get very far with your creations. You will be reinventing old failed paradigms all too readily. So this is kind of a way of describing the contrast between your world and the realm of the light being. But this is your normal mode most of the time. It is only those few among us, you and I included, who are on this journey to extend the reach of the divine human through the physical realm as a starting point and then moving into higher dimensions as a more complete being in unique ways than has ever existed heretofore. In a sense, the light beings are very much like a clone of creator in that they consist of an aspect of creator's consciousness and therefore have a kind of predefined and static existence at the outset, at least. The variation that ensues comes through the gift of free will to depart from what otherwise would be constraints of programming and potential lived before through the eons by creator in creator's experiencing. The purpose of physical existence is to take you down a tunnel into a new realm to explore. And as you do this from a naive perspective, are forced to reckon with change, uncertainty, and complexity that exceeds your awareness of how to cope, let alone conquer. This brings tremendous growth and wisdom in the doing. That is the purpose. So the joyous reunion you allude to and cannot fully appreciate is a delight awaiting all, but it is still a way station in the grand future planned for you to spread through the universe and become something much, much greater. Okay, thank you. Did you have a karmic connection to John F. Kennedy from a prior life or prior lives? And what was your spiritual mission if this was another meeting with him as an incar as incarnated humans? And if not, what brought you together? Mm -hmm.